We're, we're recording the meeting um, today. It's not being live streamed. We've got some technical difficulties with our um, internet strength here. Um, but we're going to persevere, but we will record the meeting. Um, so if you get calls from members who couldn't log into the live stream, there were technical difficulties. Um, the meeting has been recorded and we'll upload that to our YouTube channel after the fact, but we can't beat technology sometimes. Um, I'll hand over to our chairman to now host <coughs> the annual general meeting. Uh, thank you all. Um, thanks again for, for those who were here for the Safety Summit, um, for, for sticking around for the, uh, for the annual general meeting. Um, a quick overview of, uh, of what we'll do today. We'll, um, we'll do the usual business, um, we'll present some reports as finances and so on and so forth, uh, and then we'll conclude the meeting with a, a Q&A session. Um, <clears throat> what we'll do during the course of the meeting, um, we'll, we'll try and limit our questions uh, relating specifically uh, to the presentations that we've done and, and the management of the, the company throughout the year or the association prior to the, the changeover. Uh, but then we will open the floor up to more general questions, anything you want to ask on any topic uh, once the meeting has closed. So uh, I'd like to first um, tell you that the meeting is open. Um, we've got a, a couple of apologies here. Uh, Paul Smith and Ed Herring, both locals, uh, they both send their, their apologies in. I'd also like to say uh, on a, a somewhat morbid but also a positive note, um, I've I've started something a few meetings ago of mentioning those who've um, who've passed away uh, while engaging in uh, RAL's activities. Um, and today, the only name I've got on the list is is John Mooney. Um, that's that's one death, um, and as far as I'm concerned, it's it's one death too many. But it is a, a very positive note that our our fatality rate. Uh, is going down and it, and it reinforces some of the messages that Michael and Katie were passing on uh, during the, the safety, uh, safety forum. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'd like to move on uh, and confirm that we, we have a quorum. Uh, I don't think we need to do a head count. It's clear that we've got enough members here. And, uh, and present the minutes of the last AGM. Uh, everyone should have a copy of the minutes. They're distributed. Uh, around, it should be in front of you on your seat. Point of order, please. Uh, yes. Um, the agenda for this meeting has no members' resolutions or members' statements, and no member resolutions or statements are distributed. They were provided, so can I please ask the chair why they were not distributed in accordance with the Constitution? Okay, um, I believe you're Kirk then? Correct. Yep, um, firstly, thank you for coming. Uh, Yes, I, I am happy to answer that question. Uh, we put out a notice, uh, I can't think of the date off the top of my head, but it was early August. Uh, it certainly went out in the, uh, the August Sport Pilot magazine. Uh, that notice was calling for motions. We received no motions prior to the date that we, we asked for the motions to be submitted uh, in order to allow us to have time to distribute those uh, motions to, uh, to, the, uh, to the members. The date that we asked those motions to be submitted was prior to the 23rd. That would allow us to uh, distribute them on the day of the 23rd, uh, and that would meet our requirement as a company to give notice uh, of 21 days to members. Uh, the only notice we received, uh, and we've had this discussion with you, Kirk, uh, the only notice we received was at around about 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, on the night of the 23rd, which did not allow us to uh, provide sufficient uh, notice to members in accordance with the Constitution. So they weren't uh, submitted. Point of order. Constitution. Hang on, hang on, hang on, we just need to. Sorry. Point of order. Under the Constitution, 28.1b, to have any effect at all, which, is, which provides that if it is not provided in time for it to be distributed at the cost of the company, if the member putting them forward pays for the distribution, they must be distributed. I offered to make payment and was rejected out of hand. Please, point of order, explain how 28.1b is to have any effect ever if it must be before the notice of general meeting. Uh, I haven't received any request whatsoever. Uh, if you I'm sorry, but on the telephone call, when the first opportunity when I had your reasons for not providing them at an earlier date when they were first provided, both Michael Linky and Michael Mong 
on the phone, I offered to pay under 28.1b, and I stated the clause, and it was out of hand rejected. You would not accept that you would distribute them at my cost. How is 28.1b to have any effect? Because I have tried to follow the Constitution, and at every stage, for whatever reason, they have been denied, and I would like to understand how and on what advice of legal does 28.1b ever have any effect? Because it specifically, okay. in its word, says if it's not provided in time for it to be distributed with the notice of general meeting, if I put it forward, I pay, they go forward. You refuse okay. to apply I'd like, that. I'd like to respond to that if you will allow me to finish my response. Um, I have not received any notice um, in the, the original motions that, that you were willing to pay. Uh, yes, we did receive a phone call. That phone call was received uh, probably about a week ago. Um, I don't think it's feasible to send out proxy forms. Uh, we have to submit, uh, make available proxy forms to vote on any motions. Uh, we could not distribute. You yourself require notice to be written. Uh, you'll be aware of Australia Post timeframes. They take six plus days to uh, to distribute. Had you given us notice earlier, then we would have been willing to do that in accordance with the Constitution. Um, I'd like to say also on that note, we have sought legal advice at the expense of the company on these matters, and uh, and we've acted in accordance with that advice. Um, the legal advice has, has come from, uh, uh, as of yesterday, uh, three professionals in this field, uh, and we're comfortable and we will proceed on the basis of that legal advice. Thank you. Uh, so the minutes of the last annual general meeting. Uh, I'd ask you all to have a look at the, uh, those minutes and uh, if anyone has uh, any, any comments, feedback or, or changes that they would like made to those minutes, uh, could we please have that now? Um, okay, we'll, we'll move on. Um, the business of rising out of the minutes of the last annual, annual general meeting. Oh, I believe there were no actions, um, so we can tick that one off. So we'll move on to the presentation of the annual report. So, Hattie, you don't know, we're all ready to go. So, uh, I'd like to talk a, li a little bit about um, a bit about our future, where we've come from, where we're going. Um, so in, in 2015, 2016, we, we've gone through a lot of change. Uh, you'll be aware of the constitutional change that we've had. Um, there's new ops manuals, there's, there's new tech manuals, there's someone talking. Um, and we've had a, a, a bunch of other stuff uh, happen along the way as well. We've, we've had um, our tech team um, introduce, uh, or begin to introduce and test new procedures for modifications. Um, they've also made a, a submission to uh, increase the patients. Um, they've also made a, a submission um, to uh, our ops team. Uh, they've gone through a similar process with their controller airspace. Um, I don't want to dwell on that. I'll leave that to Michael to, to talk about those things. Um, so we'll move on. I've I've written a uh, an article or a, a short piece in our annual uh, annual report. The annual report is now available for download on our website, and in that. I talk about uh, the history of RAOs, but I talk about it from a perspective of, of looking at, at where we've come from, not with a, uh, a, a desire to yearn for the good old days, uh, but to, to learn about you know, some of the things that we've done uh, well, some of the things that we've done poorly, and learn from that. We want to repeat the good things, and, uh, and, and we want to uh, avoid doing the bad things again. Um, and our history, it's, it's where we, we fought to define our own rules, and we've done that fairly successfully over the years. At times, we've, um, we've, we've stumbled along the way, but if we look at where we are today, we've got uh, organisations uh, you know, struggling for things like medical reform in the aviation industry, and right now, today, uh, we are one group of, of around eight or 9,000 people um, that has medical reform that suits pilots. We have a unique system, not only here in Australia, but, but around the world. We've got people who've, uh, who've built some pretty pioneering aircraft. Our, our movement started with some guy that probably no one here knows, um, you know, building an aircraft in a shed, rolling it out, flying it in a paddock. And, and chances are that we, we don't know that guy. But a group of similar-minded people came together 
some 30 odd years ago, and they established RAOS. And that, that gave us the movement that, we, that we've got today. It's, it's a movement where we get to, within reason, define our own rules and, and set our own future. And, um, and it's, it's formed a, a group of 9,000 odd strong, um, you know, passionate aviators. So we've got to look at our history, and we've got to not yearn for it. We don't want to say that, you know, we want the good old days. Um, we want to learn from it. Michael always says, uh, if we always yearn for the good old days, and our best days are behind us. So let's look to the future and, uh, and build a better, bigger, stronger RAOs. So that's where our, our success lies. We, we've got, uh, you know, things like the controlled airspace that Jill and her team are working on. We've got the maximum takeoff weight that Jared and, uh, and Darren are working on. And that, that's going to help us remain relevant. We've seen aero clubs come and go, they've died off. Uh, we've seen other aviation organisations uh, die off. Um, there's some around today that are struggling. We have to remain relevant. So we've, our, our first big step towards that was morphing into RLs Limited. It's, it's a more appropriate structure that helps us govern it a lot better. Um, it helps us conduct our activities across the, uh, the entire country. Uh, and it, and it'll, it'll help us grow into something bigger and stronger. We're embracing new technology. Uh, Michael and Katie have both talked about the OMS, and that's just one little piece uh, of some of the things that we're doing. We've got a, a portal where people can log in and, uh, and self-serve, and we're going to be growing that and extending it, um, expanding it, so uh, CFIs can, uh, can offer more services and whatnot in the future. And we, I think this is the most important bit. We're trusting our members. Back when the, the half a dozen guys came together and formed RAOs, um, it was very easy to look over your shoulder and say, you know, we know what Jim's doing, we know what Max is doing, we know what Mary's doing. Nowadays, when we're eight and a half, nine thousand 9,000 people strong, we can't look over our shoulder, uh, or certainly Jill can't and Darren can't, uh, and, and monitor the activities of those people. So we, we're putting more trust, more faith into our members' hands and saying to you guys, you need to do the right thing. But at the same time, we're giving you the tools to do the right thing. As it stands today, we are the biggest private aviation company in Australia. Um, by that, I don't mean we're bigger than Qantas or Jetstar, but we are certainly the biggest group, the single biggest group of private aviators in Australia today. It's, th this, is, this is something that is quite unique. I said that we were unique before, and, uh, and I emphasise this point now. Um, by, by staying together, by staying strong, we can actually fight to that common cause or for that common cause going forward. We can you know, expand our privileges, we can defend the ones that we've got now. Um, and, and by acting as a collective, we can pull those resources and, uh, and, and do some really, really good things. We, we often talk about what, what's our strength. Is it the, the fact that you know, we offer an insurance product? Um, we'll talk to QE. Um, I don't think, oh yeah, we've got QBE here. Uh, we we're talking about the insurance products. Um, you know, we, we offer a unique set of insurance products. We've talked about our, our medicals. Um, you know, we, we have our own simple set of rules. So these are all our strengths? Yeah, they are. But one of our biggest strengths is, dare I say it, we're not CASA. What we are is a group of passionate aviators, like-minded aviators that are all pulling in the same direction. And if we do that, that is our single biggest strength. And it allows us to do all of these other things. It allows us to approach companies like QBM and get some great deals. It allows us to approach the regulator and defend our rights uh, in terms of medicals and so on. That's our single biggest strength, is our, is our members. Um, our history is important, but we need to think about, you know, where, where are we headed? What, what's in our future? Um, that's the, the key message that, that I, I want to leave you guys with today is, um, you know, I, I said it before, let's not yearn for our past, but let's learn from, from it. We have to you know, look forward, we have to work together. Um, you know, some of the, the resolutions that, that Kirk put forward were concerned about the Constitution. Let's, let's shape that, let's put them forward in, in new general meetings, in upcoming general meetings. And let's, let's actually work together to shape RALs into a, a better organisation. It's something we've worked hard for over the last two years and it's really beginning to, um, to pay dividends. So I think if we you know, exercise that key strength that we've got, that is our members, our strength in numbers, then I think we can build RALs into a, a really, really strong brand going forward. And on that note, I'll, um, I'll hand it over to uh, 
Barry, uh, Barry to present the um, the financial reports, and uh, and then we'll hear from our, our CEO. Thanks, Mick. I'm Barry Windle, and I had the honour of being the treasurer of the association in its last little period of this financial year that we're talking about, so I was treasurer for all of a month and a half. So I thought I'd at least take the opportunity to stand up and show my face and to uh, deal with at least one of the slides before I hand over to Michael for the detailed uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, this year we've again received an unqualified audit report, which we're very pleased about. Um, some of the highlights, 102K, $102,000 increase in revenues over the last year, 13% uh, increase in insurance costs, not quite a highlight, but Mark will explain that a bit more. Uh, we looked hard at our expenditure this year, because uh, I'll explain in a minute, but when we looked hard at it, we found that uh, we had a two, only a 2.2% increase in expenditure. Uh, which is pretty much in line with CPI, so you know, modestly uh, pleased with that uh, item. And we still retain a uh, million dollars in cash reserves in total, so we're still very liquid. Um, so there's a little, little snapshot. Might I say, though, um, we are not satisfied by a long shot with where, we're, where we are with our financials. We've got significant challenges ahead. We have so many things that we need to do and we want to do, um, and uh, we're still running uh, a deficit. Um, that deficit is declining, but I just want to make the point that uh, as a board, as a, as a treasurer for one and a half months, uh, we've got substantial work still to do. The year ahead is going to be uh, another very tough one. So um, I'm not glossing over the fact, uh, that fact. Uh, but at least we do have some positives to talk about today and I'll hand over Michael to enlarge on those. Thank you, Barry. Uh, and yes, just to echo Barry's words, um, we're not satisfied until such time that we can return the members a, a balanced budget and start to, to put money back in the bank or return more services to members. Um, we're not going to be satisfied. We're going to continue to work hard to achieve that. But right now, we're in a, a difficult um, three to five year period where we're going through significant structural change in the organisation um, to try and get on top of some of those um, expenses. You know, 80, 85, 86% of our revenue comes from our members um, and that's crucial uh, to us. Um, but members are, are slowly declining and we'll have a look at some more um, detailed numbers. So we're still trying to turn things around. Uh, we reduced the deficit by 15% year on year, so we're continually to put pressure on reducing our deficit. Uh, as Barry mentioned, we're keeping our expenses in tow. We haven't added any new expenditure, 2% increase in expenditure, 2.2% um, is acceptable, it's moderate. We haven't gone out and said let's buy ourselves a whole heap of new things. Uh, we reduced uh, the financial uh, burden from Sport Pilot. A couple of years ago, Sport Pilot was costing us over $400,000 a year. Um, and with our subscription model, uh, we've taken a lot of the pressure off the organisation um, in funding uh, that product. Uh, we're introducing a number of um, insurance me measures, and we've got Jeff with us today, and we talked about insurance during our safety seminar. Um, insurance was starting to blow out, as Barry mentioned, the 13% increase in insurance. We weren't satisfied with the services that our insurance provider were offering us. We thought we could do better for our members, so we went out and we negotiated a better deal. And one of the, the, the highlights um, that QB have given us is a commitment that our public liability policy, um, the cost of that policy has been locked in for three years. There's no guarantee, no increase uh, for three years with our public liability. And that's just a fantastic, makes it so much easier for me as a CEO and, and Barry and the rest of the board to plan when you know what your insurance costs, your insurance costs are going to be at that level. Remembering that our public liability policy for our members is about 
75, 80 percent of our total insurance bill. So it gives us some certainty about planning and, and allowing us um, some knowledge about what we need to do in the future. Uh, we're reducing waste in the office part of the modernisation project. Um, if you would have seen a slide earlier today, we used to use a pallet of paper a month. We're using a couple of reams now, so we're reducing waste in the office. We're relying on technology rather than printing. We're using smart meetings when generally when this team get together, I very rarely see the remote office. So that Darren and Neil and Jill, who work remotely, um, we, we tele telecommute all the time. We speak to them all the time on the phone, have face to face meetings using Skype. We get together probably two or three times a year. So thinking smarter and the board um, is about to adopt that similar philosophy. So rather than face to face meetings all the time, uh, the board are looking at using technology to get together again, saving costs. Uh, that goes hand in glove with starting to use technology, tapping into technology and using technology to reduce our costs. And marketing RLs to a whole new generation of pilots, really it's the first time that RLs has had a dedicated marketing plan. The board approved that in May, um, a 12 month plan to market, promote and improve RLs and we're starting to see uh, dividends from that. Uh, so what are some of the figures? We have a deficit of 227,000, as we said about 15% down on last year. Revenue was just up $100,000, that's about a 4% increase, and expenses were up 2.2%. So generated more revenue uh, than we did the increase in expense, which allowed us to re reduce the deficit, but there's still more work to do. Uh, we've got 2.1 million in assets, about a million of those in liquid and cash assets, so we're still cash-rich, um, cash which is fantastic. If we're a private, uh, public company, we might be targeted to take over with that much cash but the board is, is committed to using that cash wisely. Last year they took a decision to invest in the modernisation project. Uh, this time round, it's a much more conservative view from the board. Uh, so there won't be any major investments in new um, pro projects at that level uh, for the next few years. Um, and we used a lot of cash this year, that's what I said, part of our modernisation project was the investment of cash into that modernisation, tapping into technology, reducing waste, and over time that will have long-term benefits because it's not money, it's an investment in money that we won't be spending in the future. So it's really going to allow us to tap into technology. Uh, there's been a 24% reduction in our printing costs already, that's in the first year of the modernisation project. There's been a 40% increase in our depreciation, so it's a non-cash item, but it does make your deficit higher as you transfer capital assets across to your profit and loss um, and with the investment in the modernisation project we need to write that off over uh, 8 to 10 years that's going to have an impact on our depreciation so you'll see the accounts over the next few years carrying a higher <coughs> depreciation cost which put pressure on the deficit but in terms of the business it's not a cash expense you're not spending money but it is a significant part um, of the investment um, that's what I've said there We introduced a subscription model for Sport Pilot, which has reduced some of the pressure on the budget. Uh, cost of production of Sport Pilot uh, was 269,000. As I said, it used to cost us 400,000, um, and the magazine still costs us 129,000 dollars to deliver a year. So the net cost um, of the magazine still to deliver. We'd like to get that down to zero. Uh, we think we've got it priced at the right point for members at this point in time. Um, it is an agenda item uh, for the board to discuss over the next couple of days. So what's on the, the landscape? Um, our major cost items, obviously our salary costs and the, the staff team. Um, significant cost in the organisation, but we're running four staff lighter than we were when I started. We've got a team of 15, 16 bodies. It's equivalent to about 15 staff with a couple of part-timers. Um, so that's a significant cost. Obviously our insurance costs, and as we've said, we're locking in some of those costs for the next three years, which is good. Um, and the cost to reduce sport pilot, that's the third biggest cost in the organisation. So it's, a, um, it's an organisation that has you know, some key trigger points that can impact our finances quite significantly. The reliance on membership revenue as the key point of revenue, and those three high costs um, make up about 90, 92% of all your costs. So that's it on the finance reports. Um, we've distributed a full audit and copy. As Barry said, it was an unqualified audit. Uh, from that, the audit letter is there. Um, happy to take questions on the accounts.
on the printed magazine, the continued loss, um, given that the loss per magazine, given the number of subscriptions that have been told and the old number of subscriptions, the loss per magazine is increased over what it used to be. Overall, it's lower because we don't have as many subscriptions. Over what period of time does RAOs expect to get that back to where members are no longer subsidising a sale of a product that we no, don't have unless we pay extra? It, 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 it's a very sensitive question. Um, the, the magazine is a sensitive topic, uh, Kirk. It's, it's something that we're passionate about, and I think at a, when I think I know at a meeting recently, at a number of fines I went to, I said, and I'm committed to this, and I know the board is committed to this, is that we're not going to have a subscription model for Sport Park forever. I, 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 my ideal end game for Sport Park is to deliver a printed magazine to every member for free. That's that's where we want to be. But today, that's not possible. Right now, financially, it's not possible. So that their subscription model is working. We've got over 2,000 subscribers. We've had another 120 in the last month. Subscri 124 people subscribe to it. So it's very popular. Um, but, but, but the problem is, it's very popular. It may be very popular, but at the price, we are losing more on every sold subscription than we used to lose when we were running it for ourselves and giving it to every member. That's, the, that's my point, is it's actually losing more persons. I'd love to buy one if I wasn't a member, because of course, someone else is paying for a significant amount of it. Everyone's getting, if you bought it at the uh, news agent at $8.80 cover price, you're covering the cost of it. So you're not subsidising it. So if you weren't a member and you're buying our magazine, you know, members aren't subsidising that cost because but it's sold on- members are subsidising $129,000 in the last year. We subsidise $129,000 from our general member subscriptions and assets and financials to support a printed magazine. You can. Um, it's, it's a very good point, Kirk, um, and it's it's relevant. Uh, but we've we've got to remember that um, every member gets this magazine, and there is a fixed cost of producing the magazine. So if you read it electronically, there's still a cost associated with that. You've still got to pay for the, you know, the story to be produced, the magazine layout, and so on and so forth. So uh, you know, at $129,000 loss, it's actually le less than that $400,000 cost to produce it for every single member. Uh, on top of that, we've got 2,000 uh, odd, sub odd subscribers that are um, then paying for the, the printing and the distribution. So we have to look at that in, in two sort of discrete components. The cost of producing the magazine for everyone, including the printed guys, but also the electronic uh, readers out there. And then on top of that, we've got to look at that printing and distribution cost. So can you clarify, is the $129,000 loss relating to the whole production magazine or the subscription sold only, the printing? That's overall. Can I please ask that the uh, that that on the that that members be provided with how much, or, or if you can confirm it now, that the people who are purchasing and printed are absolutely paying for all of the printing, distribution, and postage costs that are associated with it. If they're not, then the members are still subsidising the, the printed magazine. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, as Mick said. There's a cost to produce a magazine. Whether you print it or don't print it, there's a cost. That cost should be borne by all members. Yep. And that cost is shared. And then there is a printing and distribution cost, which the members who subscribe pay that. And the annual subscription works out at about $5.70 uh, uh, an issue, and the cost is about $5.50 to produce that whole issue. So And, and post it and Yes. Okay, yeah. that's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm answering. It's never been clear. That, well, that's the first time somebody asked the question. But the, the interesting thing from that is the people, the members who don't subscribe, the members who don't subscribe to the magazine are subsidising the members who subscribe to it because there's still the cost to the organisation. So it's not the members who get it. They, they're paying full freight. They're paying the cost of production. And that's how we worked out the model from day one. We projected about 3,000 members would subscribe and we pitched our pricing at that. Okay. Um, can, we've got can I clarify one thing then? What has been the communication path and around the magazine from RAA has been 
to break even with the printed magazine, we need 3,300 subscriptions or thereabouts. Thereabouts. What you're saying is that the current sales are covering their marginal cost of printing and distributing, which means they're already breaking even. What, we, what it should be is if we get to 3,300, the printed ones are covering the whole cost of the electronic. That's a big, huge bonus from the RIA, and you've got members out here getting annoyed with the way you've presented information. If you'd presented it clearly as I've just received it, I'd have been patting you on the back rather than slagging you off. Okay, okay. thank you. I don't think you're slagging off, I think we're just having a conversation, so. I'm sorry, I'm on forums. All right, any other questions? No? Okay. Oh. Uh, hello. Uh, just concerning the subscription of the magazine, last year in June I paid a subscription plus six issues, which made 18 issues. Now I got a magazine a couple of days ago for the October. Now at the end of this year, my subscription will come due. You send out reminders all times of the year or just June? Uh, you'll get a reminder to renew your subscription when it's due. Okay. Yeah. So that will come and you'll be either renew using paper or we'll go directly into your members portal and renew online. Any other questions on the finances? Okay. Katie, we might put the next presentation up. <coughs> so we've just got a um, presentation now on the overall um, organisation and what's been delivered in the last 12 months to members. And one of the, the key things that we want to do is we, we recognise that members saw values in the magazine. We want to see what value we can return to members and a lot of the safety information that we've distributed today is an example of that returning values, value to members. And it's, you know, some of this information that we distribute has more value to a member because it's, it's more safety related, it's more directly related to their relationship with the organisation. Um, than some of the information that was contained in the magazine. Um, obviously it's not replacing the magazine. Thanks, Katie. So four key things there. The organisation is stable. The same management team that, that sat here last year um, is sitting here today. We've got a very stable team in the office and a lot of stability on the board, even though we went through a, a macro organisational reform, macro organisational change, uh, six of the seven board members um, have had experience sitting on a board in recent history. So organisation is very stable. That was one of the concerns that we had three or four years ago, really losing our stability. Uh, the safety culture, as we saw from the safety summit today, is starting to change, it's significant change, and it's permeating all levels of the organisation. It's just not, at the, the board level or the staff level or CFI level, it's starting to, to get, we're seeing more and more reports and more willingness of people to report. The financial health is improving and we're very engaged with our members. Um, lots more channels than just support part to engage with members. There's Facebook, we've got more Facebook followers than we do members. We've got our e-users that go out, the safety summer that we run, the hangar talks, the fly-ins that we attend, um, and Oscosh last week as an example of a combined fly-in. Um, so much more engagement with members in the last 12 months. Um, last year, um, we had 12 or 13 things that we wanted to do. Um, and I'm happy to say that other than, you know, we, we said we were going to balance the books. We didn't get there balancing the books. Uh, we didn't achieve the sport pilot projected revenue. Um, that's one of the reasons we didn't balance the books. It proves to us that the digital copy is very popular. But every one of these things we said last year, we promised our members that we would deliver them. And I'm very pleased, very proud to say that not only we delivered <coughs> all 11 of those, yesterday we delivered the 12th, uh, and that was the modification and repair approval process. Um, we had to get submissions into CASA and get those approved for CASA. It's dragged on and dragged on, but Darren was advised yesterday by CASA that the first MRAP application um, was approved. So, dozen things we said we'd do, um, done it. And this team has worked hard, the board has worked hard, um, in delivering those. The two key ones that members have been asking us about obviously are the CTA and the MTO. And the, the work that went into those two applications, Tony King on the board working with Jared and Darren and Mick uh, working with Jill 
um, and Neil on those two applications respectively just did a fantastic job. The quality of those applications uh, is phenomenal. Um, so I'm very pleased with those two. And as you can see, a number of other things that we've delivered there. The new tech manual and the office manual's out, the constitutional reform is a biggie, uh, modernisation, a whole range of other things that we've been able to deliver to members. So that's some of the value that you get that you don't often see. You know, people look for tangible things as they're in their membership fees, but um, creating new documents, new pathways to safety, um, and opportunities to increase the endorsements and the ability to fly um, essential to your, your membership. Uh, highlighting some of our success stories. Well, the safety um, is a success story there. People telling us, continually improving, using those safety messages to continually improve safety. And I think that's, um, that's a critical cycle that we've developed in the organisation. Um, it, it is really starting to become critical to us and important and members are really starting to hear that message. So it's, it's working, as Katie mentioned earlier, 25% increase in the number of reports uh, people giving to us. People aren't getting more, we're not having more incidents, we're having more people, more willingness to report because of the culture that we're creating in the organisation. And we've had fewer accidents um, this year than we had over the last couple of years. So everything's looking up in that regard. On our radar, things that we need to do. Um, obviously our financial, our safety management system, we're about three quarters of the way there and over the next 12 or 18 months that starts to look like a toolbox. It's tools that members can use whether you're a club with 20 aircraft, a school with 20 aircraft or a school with one aircraft, that toolbox becomes available to you over the next 12 or 18 months and there's a significant amount of work uh, that's gone into that. Uh, we're improving our member engagement. We need to do more there. I want to do more. I want to hear from members. As Katie said, we're not the, the, the keeper of all the ideas. We've got 9,000, 8,500, 9,000 members out there. Tell us, give us some ideas and we can improve. Um, getting ready for part 149, that's a, a massive thing. Everything we're doing, we're doing now in the light of 149. The ops manual, the tech manual, the constitution, it's all been written thinking that 149 um, is going to happen. Uh, the volunteering strategy, we did a lot of work with volunteers this year with our professional development. Jewel and Neil did some fantastic seminars um, across the country working with our volunteers. Um, and now we're preparing, starting to prepare for CTA and Info. We're so confident that CTA and Info are going to be approved by CASA that we're going to put some groundwork um, into those applications. Uh, but we can do better. Lots of things that we can do. We can engage more with, with women. We're attending the Women of Aviation Conference next week. We got heavily involved in the Women of Aviation Week in March this year. Uh, I think we can do better with collaborating. We announced last week at Oscosh that uh, the SAAA are tapping into our current management system. That's a product that we built and we paid for. SAAA have now paid it. We've paid for a third of that system by licensing it to the SAAA. There's more we can do. And as Nick says, push the stick forward, the trees get smaller, pull the stick bigger, pull the stick back, the trees get smaller. If we're working with other organisations, it's about aviation, and we want to collaborate and work with these uh, organisations. And working with our schools, as Katie said, 170 packages went out to all our schools on the safety uh, month products that we delivered. The schools are our lifeblood. You know, they, they get the members in, they get the students in, they get the members, they get people engaged with the organisation. So working very closely with schools. And working with that rogue behaviour, there still is an element within our organisation that wants to do the wrong thing. Um, they're the members we don't want. And I said to the board a couple of times, if they're the people that leave the organisation, it, it doesn't bother us, it shouldn't bother us. We're a much more mature organisation today than we've ever been in the past. A couple of things in detail. The hot topics, um, our digitisation project, significant interest in digitisation at our website. Um, still only half, under half of our members opening the e-users, so we need to come up with strategies to get people to open their electronic newsletters, look at them, get more information, um, and get, get that happening. There's about 22,000 names on that list, so they're not all members, so that number's quite good. Looking at Sport Pilot readership. When I started, people used to tell me we read Sport Pilot from cover to cover. And often I'd ask members about articles or talk about articles that were in Sport Pilot that people didn't remember. So I don't know whether people, everybody read every Sport Pilot cover to cover. And the data, we never used to know because we just sent a magazine out. But now we're getting some digital click-throughs and we know 
which page because people are reading on the issue website we can tell which page people log into how long they spend on a page and it's starting to give us intelligence uh, about the magazine but we need to get more people reading it looking at our members numbers we're still seeing a drift of about three percent a year um, it drifts in winter the, the, the downside of this when we report is we report in june on our membership but just now we start to see hundreds of members join the organisation. Our membership balloons and increases in November, December, but then when we report at the end of the year, it drops down again. Uh, the average age is dropping. We're seeing uh, members who are older starting to the age coming down. So we're losing older members or we're getting more, more people through. We're doing more analysis on that. Um, I think a little bit of, of the both is true. Um, and our, air fleet, our fleet is staying the same. Um, that eight, three axis making up um, the vast majority of our fleet. So it's a um, very solid fleet of aircraft, very young fleet. Um, occurrences. Had seven in the last 12 months, nine the year before. Uh, the normalised average is 1.9 instead of 3.7. So again, all the messages that we heard earlier in the safety summit, the data is proving that that message, those messages uh, are working. So we hope to see a continued improvement of that and a significant reduction in the number of accidents over the last 12 months. Um, but we've had some incidents. They go up. But that's good, people are reporting. And I think that's it. So do we have any questions about the general operation of the business? Michael. Barry. Could you explain part 149, please? I can. Unless Mick wants to. I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll do it. Part 149 is a new part that, um, it, of the Civil Aviation Act that CASA are introducing to convert what the recreational aviation uh, bodies, RCS AAA, HDFA, GFA um, and a few others, into rather than having exemptions under the CAOs, we then have our own piece of legislation that we develop a document, our documents around that we develop a set of documents around that part and we no longer have exemptions from the CAOs. So we operate under our own set of rules as a self-administering sport organisation uh, with delegation from CASA rather than operating under the exemptions. So essentially the difference is the exemptions will be removed and there will be a rule set that we operate under. The advantage for us is we get to set that rule set. Um, the legislation is very broad um, and allows us to set our rule sets that so may introduce some opportunities for us to do some additional uh, things that we traditionally haven't been allowed to do in recreational aircraft. Um, it's been on the radar for 15 years? 20? 20 years? Um, we asked CASA a couple of weeks ago, are we going to get a Christmas present with 149? And they said, watch this space. Um, which Christmas, who knows? Um, but there is moves now um, to get it happening in the next 12 or 18 months. Fairly significant. So I don't know whether you want to say any more on 149. I, I think from uh, from my perspective, Part 149 is going to be positive for RAOs. I know a few of the other organisations are going to struggle uh, you know, financially to, to prepare themselves for 149, and it will hit us as well. There's going to be a financial impulse. Um, don't have any doubts about that. One of the things that I do like about it, though, is the system is set up, rather than CASA approving every single thing that we do, what they do is they, they approve processes and systems, uh, and then they audit. Um, us against those. It's, it's a bit like a, uh, say, a financial or the accounting standards. Um, you've got an accounting standard, no one looks over your shoulder and makes sure that you, you know, you put every, um, you know, expense and revenue item in the right line and, and things like that. But at the end of each year, you get audited. And that's, that's akin to the system that, uh, that CAS is going to be bringing in. And, uh, and what that does is uh, two things. Firstly, it gives us um, a little bit more sort of onerous requirements in the, the sense that we've got to have more rigorous systems and, and processes in place and that's where the cost comes uh, but it also gives us a little bit more uh, freedom and, uh, and flexibility down the track so I think for RAOs it's going to be a very positive thing uh, going forward but, but um, I do want to highlight the fact that there is a cost involved uh, with that. Any more questions? Cost, what, any indications what those costs could be? No idea. It's not $5,000. It's, 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 it, 
It's not going to be significant, but it's going to be you know, a, a moderate cost, I would think, because we need to get expertise to write the exposition. There's a number of documents that need to be written. Uh, something, something to keep in mind is, at the moment, even though 149 is not in, uh, anything that we modify, be it an ops manual, um, our constitution that we brought in, we've written it uh, to be compliant with the 149 uh, requirements as we know them today. They could change, uh, but we have seen various drafts of the 149 uh, regulations. Um, so everything that we're doing today is designed in anticipation of that coming in. So we, we're trying to ready ourselves um, right now, but things like uh, an exposition, the part 149 exposition document, that doesn't exist today, that will be a new document. And, um, and it's likely that we'll hire outside expertise to prepare those. Uh, we don't have the skills or the capacity uh, internally to do those sorts of documents ourselves and, uh, and nor do we want to commit ourselves to those expenses long term. So we'll, we'll just um, hire external people to, to help us through that process and, uh, and then leverage our sort of operations and, and technical staff to provide input rather than actually draft those documents uh, from scratch. Any other questions? All right, back to you. <coughs> uh, okay, we, we did have one item on the agenda uh, that some people may have seen, but um, unfortunately we couldn't get the resolutions out, much the same problem we faced with Kirk's. Um, we're looking to appoint a new auditor. Um, we couldn't get the the proxy documents um, printed, distributed, uh, etc. in time. So we're going to hold that over until the next meeting so every me member has an opportunity. Um, at this point, I think um, I'd like to hand back to Michael. Michael's our returning officer to um, talk through the, the process that we went through for the elections and, uh, and we'll declare the result of the elections. Point forward, please. Yes, go. Point of order in relation to the entire election process. RAA Oz, as a limited company, only came into registration after the nominations had closed and the calls for nominations were under a constitution that did not apply. Point of order second, even the method that we wish to describe for how it was to be done were not finalised before the calls were made because from the minutes of the meetings, they were only approved by the board on the 10th of August. That These core problems with how this election was called and run are the fundamental core of the resolutions that I did attempt to put forward. So I am point of order asking for clarification how any election process that did not have an approved set of methodology or rules until the 10th of August, or calling for nominations under a constitution 21 days before it became effective is in all valid as the constitution requires that all procedures for appointment following election must meet at least the requirements of the Australian Electoral Commission or equivalent, and specifically around communication and making available the rules, not done. Mr. Chairman, uh, that's not a proper point of order. Um, just hold, hold on, Spencer. Mr. Chairman, I um, move that that be ruled out as uh, not a proper point of order. It's, uh, it's long rambling and doesn't address any specific point. And uh, the meeting should make that decision. Okay, thanks, Spencer. Um, look, Kirk, we've, we've discussed this at length, uh, and, and I've, I've advised, and I'd like to advise the whole, whole meeting before we move on. Uh, we sought uh, paid advice on, on the process of transitioning to a, a company limited by guarantee. Uh, we sought advice on the, the validity of the, the process, uh, not from one, but two practicing lawyers um, in this field. And, uh, and once again, we're comfortable with that advice, and, uh, and, and we'll move on on the basis of that advice. Thanks. Um, I'd like to move a motion, a, re a resolution from the floor, please, in relation to the election. Uh, go ahead. 
I would like to move the members resolve to refuse to appoint any member as director following the election process in July and August of 2016 as they have not been elected by the members in accordance with the constitution. I move order, that. Point of order, Mr Chairman. That is not an appropriate uh, uh, note. The, the, point of, the uh, proposed resolution is not an appropriate resolution for this annual general meeting. Can I ask for clarification, please, as the election of directors is a standing item for every AGM. And if the validity of the process leading up to the appointment of proposed directors is not valid, I would like to understand how that is. Did you want to respond to that, Spencer? Yeah. Uh, the, meeting has been, uh, the meeting has been called with you notice. Uh, those who wish to make uh, make objection to any matter at a general meeting are required to give notice in accordance with the constitution. Uh, it has been ruled that any of the, the, the efforts that came to light were not within the range of uh, satisfactory resolutions. It's uh, inappropriate to raise a resolution now for the annual general meeting. Its job is to deal with the matters on the table and uh, that proposed resolution is a, it's a fresh resolution and has no validity in this meeting. Thank you, Spencer. Um, <clears throat> I concur with Spencer's view and, uh, and, and on that basis, uh, I won't allow the motion to be raised from the floor. Uh, if you'd like to put that motion to the next general meeting uh, and, and give every member an equal opportunity to, uh, to vote on that, then uh, we'd welcome your submission. Thanks, Vic. Uh, so the election, was right as we've just heard in accordance with the constitution and appropriately we have 10 nominees for five positions um, and the board took decision to run a first past the post so each vote counted as one uh, vote and in total uh, tony king received 29 votes and was elected first congratulations tony Trevor Bant was elected second with 526 votes. <laughs> Eugene Reed third with 495 votes. <laughs> Rod Biddle fourth with 458 votes. <laughs> and joining the board for the first time with 399 votes, Luke Bailey. The Constitution provides for terms for each of those directors and the Constitution allows for the directors to determine the terms uh, based on the decision making process that the board will take tomorrow uh, as well as appointment of a chairman uh, tomorrow. So that will happen as part of the board meeting and when those terms are known we will publish those to members. But um, I'll now hand back to our chairman to conclude the meeting. Thank you Michael. Um, on that note, I'd like to welcome the, both the returning and the, the newcomer, Luke, uh, to the board. Uh, congratulations to all. Um, it's not an official piece of business, but I also like to say as part of the AGM, uh, there's a tremendous amount of effort that goes into organising these events, as well as the other events that, that we have throughout the year. Um, we've, we've got, as you can see, there's a lot of staff here, uh, not just for this, but for the Safety Summit and a few other follow-up uh, items throughout the week. And these guys, throughout the year, they, they give a huge amount of their time uh, to, to prepare for these events, attend these events. Um, most of these guys have got family back home. I think, um, I think Michael mentioned it before, Jared doesn't have kids, but he's working on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, um, thank you to, to everyone. You've, you've given up just over the last couple of weeks a huge amount of time away from your family. It's very, very much appreciated. Not just by me, but the, I, I think I speak on behalf of the board and, and the entire membership. Um, Last, last week was a, a great example of the, the effort that you put in uh, for a huge event, the, the first uh, Oscosh, the first collaborative event of its kind, and, uh, and I've heard nothing but positive. Uh, and on that note, um, I will close the meeting uh, for official business, but we will hang around, so if anyone's got any questions about anything related to RAOS, uh, we'll take a quick five minute break and, uh, and then feel free to come back and, um, and we'll uh, answer any, any questions that you might be uh, wanting to ask. Thank you.